Good afternoon, and thank you for joining. I'm Matt Roth with Baylor College of Medicine, and I welcome you to today's presentation. The Extracellular RNA Communication Consortium is an NIH common fund program which works to advance the science and research of extracellular RNA. The consortium hosts monthly presentations on a variety of research topics, and I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Tom Tushel from Rockefeller University. His talk today is titled, Automated Isolation and Deep Sequencing Characterization of Nucleic Acids from Cell-Free Biofluids for Clinical Analysis. Tom? Yeah, thank you, Matt. Um, hello, everyone, on the remote end. Um, so this, what I'm going to present to you is figures generated um, for publication. We hope to submit a manuscript soon and all of these um, topics that I'm going to touch upon on. And it's mostly the, uh, the work of Klaus Max, who is a structural biologist in my laboratory, but um, then um, you know, changed direction. Um, and, um, and it was initiated by Ido and Zeph many years ago. Um, those are two clinicians that were interested in extracellular RNAs in plasma and urine samples. And Zeph um, is also part of this U19 grant application, um, and he is the person responsible for um, collecting the samples and, and conducting the study, whereas our laboratory is responsible for executing the chemistry, the RNA isolation, and the sequencing and the data analysis. Um, now I'm, okay. Um, sorry, I, I'm having trouble with the computer to respond. Um, so in the next slide um, is a summary of the, the study that I'm going to present. So our we knew at the time we, we started these experiments that in extracellular fluid, um, like plasma and serum, you could discover microRNAs that were specifically expressed in tissues such as the liver or the heart upon injury, and that there was a good correlation with protein biomarkers um, or, or diagnostic bio, protein diagnostic markers and the microRNAs, as long as they had specific um, signatures. And so the, that increased our curiosity to, to see, first of all, what's the baseline profile and is there much variability across individuals? And then that led to the study design where we decided to collect EDTA plasma and serum from 13 healthy individuals um, that were seven male and six female. And um, the collection period was every two weeks over two months and there were three time points during the collection day, before the meals, four hours after the meals. And uh, some of these samples were processed in duplicate, and so in total uh, we processed 192 plasma samples and 96 serum samples. And just to remind you, plasma is um, when you centrifuge down the cell pellet, um, in this case, it's also platelet-depleted plasma, whereas serum is collected when you carry the blood through coagulation and then you remove the blood clot. So when we isolate RNA, we try to adapt it to small volumes that are typically available in clinical archives. So we begin our analysis with 450 microliters of plasma or serum. Uh, which means you have to start off with about one milliliter of blood to get to that uh, amount of biofluid. About 50% is serum or plasma liquid that you can collect from whole blood. Um, as you all know, extracellular fluids like urine and plasma, they are very rich in ribonucleases um, and also DNases, and only RNA that's either protected in microvesicles or protein-bound segments of RNA can be stable in, in these environments. And then when you try and recover RNA and you initiate this through denaturation, um, ribonucleases are very resistant to denaturation. So in these first few seconds of um, contacting a denaturin and a plasma, with, a, with a plasma sample, there can be rapid degradation of the RNA as it comes off your denaturing protein. And so you need to really very well control the denaturation. That's a very important part. So it has to be rapid and complete 
In our cases, it requires the use of um, reducing agents. Those are the most effective ways of inactivating ribonucleases. And then we follow this with proteolysis using rib, um, proteinase that the RNA can, uh, sorry, that the ribonucleases can never renature or the DNases can never renature um, as they are um, digested at least partially. And we verify um, the quality of our denaturation and, and, and recovery of RNA by spiking into the denaturant a set of RNA oligonucleotides um, that we can later then recover and, and look if they were damaged or not. So after um, this uh, denaturation, we then use the phase separation procedure similar to classic DNA RNA isolation protocols with phenol chloroform. And you can drive the DNA either into the organic phase or the aqueous phase. And, um, and so at low concentration of the guanidinium isothiocyanate, the RNA stays in the aqueous phase and the DNA in the organic phase. Uh, we then process the aqueous phase, uh, run it over uh, silica column purification to remove any residual denaturant and recover it in a very small volume of about 50 microliters, which then 50% of it is used as the input for small RNA library preparation. And we spike it with another set of calibrator RNAs to monitor then the process of library preparation. Um, so if you want to recover DNA, you take the retained organic phase, add more guanidinium isocyanate which then pushes the DNA into the aqueous phase and you do the same purification protocol um, before. And so with the exception of the rapid denaturation, everything is done on a liquid handling robotic system with 96 well plates. And the denaturation, you use a multi-channel pipette so that you can mix your samples uh, effectively with the denature. On the next slide, um, it's just a quality control. So if your spike is radioactive, in this case, it's DNA restriction fragments, synthetic single-strand DNA, I think, in part, as well as um, um, synthetic radio-labeled RNAs, as well as an in vitro transcript of 500 nucleotides in length. So the red things are the RNA. And you can see that as you carry um, this through a um, isolation protocol, the RNA um, is nicely separate from the DNA. The DNA contains a tiny hint of RNA, which you don't really need to remove um, because you never reverse transcribing, um, um, you never reverse transcribe this RNA in the DNA fraction when you prepare for DNA sequencing. Um, so the recovered RNA, when you run it through science analysis, it's predominantly short RNA. And I think it's predominantly still ribosomal fragments and tRNA fragments. But when we characterize the RNAs, we use a protocol that enriches for 5 prime phosphate, 3 prime hydroxyl containing RNAs, and therefore microRNAs, um, which you know are also protein protected microRNAs. But um, I think relative to the total RNA content, they're still um, in the minority. And if you converted 5 prime phosphate and 3 prime hydroxyl ends of your entire input RNA to be consistent with this protocol, you would realize that the micronic content drops to a few percent, whereas when you carry out this protocol, the micronic content stays about 50 percent. And, and so the way we prepare in our library, we have um, inputs that are in the low nanogram range from you know, half of the half milliliter serum or plasma sample. Uh, we spike a few atomol of these calibrator sets to it. And, and then in the well of, I think, a micro titer plate, you join a barcoded three prime adapter to one of your samples. Um, so the very first step of, of your RNA is an adapter barcode ligation step. Um, and then you can pool after the ligation reaction um, these 24 barcoded samples, process them together, and then join the next adapter, and then reverse transcribe the pool sample. So we process samples in batches of 24, um, and also sequence them in batches of 20, uh, 
than, than um, the batch of 24. So the composition of the biofluid sequence um, is shown in the next slide. I think you should best look in the line that says median. Um, so for serum, you get about 2.2 million sequence reads. The calibrator sequence reads are about 1% or less within each sample. And, um, and when you annotate the reads, we have a category in core samples. So these are things we can map and um, match to the human transcriptome. And then we have a subset of sequence we call technical, um, which is a collection of various artifacts of um, small RNA library preparation byproducts. Um, these are, for example, adapter-adapter ligation products without inserts in many cases. But it's also um, when you generate RNA ligases, they're bacterial recombinant produced. So there's sometimes a trace amount of bacterial RNA present. And we also uh, remove such sequences. And, um, and the less RNA you use, the more technical issues there are. Yeah. So the protocol here is, of, is such that more than half or three quarters um, is actually your sample. And um, um, these other problems that can arise, you have to sort of manage either by using more input RNA or by making cleaner enzymes and, and similar um, processes. Um, so in serum, the microRNA content is a little above 50 percent, um, whereas in plasma it's close to 80 percent. And when the microRNA content is reduced, it's at the um, the other reads distribute to ribosomal RNA, tRNA, and small cytoplasmic RNAs, which is predominantly the five prime end of yRNA. So the from these categories of RNA, the most interesting are the microRNAs because they are expressed by POL2 promoters and they can inform you about tissue specificity. Um, we also look at the other RNAs, and I can say a few words later, um, but um, those are all ubiquitously expressed and, and, um, and, and I think it's mostly turnover products that you are discovering. So if you want to quantify the microRNA content, you can um, relate to your spike in calibrators, the set that uh, first is in the denaturant, and you will realize that, um, um, that there is more RNA in plasma than there is in serum. It's maybe a little counterintuitive. Um, because in serum, you so in plasma, we remove the platelets. It's platelet depleted. Um, whereas when you are in serum, you expect to release in coagulation the content of platelets that should increase the microRNA content. But then the blood clot that forms, I think, is responsible for trapping some of the RNA that's in serum. And overall, you get a reduced quantity of of microRNA. And I'll come to this a little later when we discuss profiles, where you can clearly see platelet specific profiles accumulate in the serum. Um, so you know that there's additional release. Um, and there's depletion of blood specific or erythrocyte specific microRNAs, which I think is the, um, the capture in the blood clot. And then you see person number 12 in this um, diagram here um, with the yellow sphere around it um, is something unusual that happened to us, and you may recall earlier presentations. Um, this is an individual that has also distinct microRNA profiles, um, and, um, and he has elevated extracellular RNA levels in microRNA levels. So yet it's a, it's a healthy volunteer. If you go a little bit into more detail of the microRNA sequence distribution, you will, um, you know, we've categorized the microRNAs, tRNAs, um, the yRNAs, and ribosomal RNAs. And 
um, and then resolve them by length. So you see the clear peak around 22 nucleotides for microRNAs. Um, tRNAs also show up as peaks um, around 30 nucleotides. These are the five prime fragments of a subset of tRNAs that are sensitive to hydrolysis. tRNAs have five prime phosphates um, at the end. And, um, and then the yRNAs also appear in the similar spectrum. Um, so when you approximate RNA um, for the small RNA isolation procedures or library preparation procedures, you have to be cautious how you set your windows. So if you want to really monitor the ratios of tRNAs to microRNAs, you have to be certain to include that tRNA peak of 30 to 32 nucleotides and not cut it off when you aim at purifying microRNAs uh, at around 20 nucleotides. Um, maybe one interesting point to note is when you look at these tRNAs, um, you can, you, you not only discover five primates of tRNAs that have five prime phosphates, but you also discover um, the three prime trailer sequences of tRNA primary transcripts. Um, and um, these are shown here um, in the minus P and K lines in blue. Um, minus P and K means the regular sequencing protocols that we have applied. If you were to apply a uh, phosphorylation step prior to small RNA library preparation, which also cleans up the three primates because of the phosphatase activity of, of polynucleotide kinase, um, you see sort of inversion of these things um, where um, you realize that the majority of tRNA 5 prime ends um, or, or the majority of 3 prime ends of mature tRNA fragments um, were phosphorylated. When you lose the phosphate, then they shoot up um, because they become sequenceable. They, they are turned into 5 prime phosphate, 3 prime hydroxyl parts. So, um, it's something just to keep in mind how you process your sample and how you adjust your ends, how peaks and intensities can change and discoveries can change. And when you read papers, um, you just need to pay attention to this. Um, so in the uh, data analysis approach, now we, um, I'm going to show you unsupervised clustering of microRNA read frequencies. That's the equivalent to RPKMs and mRNA sequencing, but because microRNA is the same length, you don't need to really normalize by read length. And, um, and across samples, um, you would monitor variations in expression by using a uh, program called DESEC2 in R, um, optimized for these clinical studies. The diagrams that I'm going to show you are a little complex. And so I took the legends out first. So um, we categorized samples by how many reads we had available for a particular library, so how deep it is. Um, we have color code for the biofluid if it's plasma or zero. Then the individuals have a track where we color code females and males. And the person 12, um, where we collected samples within two months, and then also one year later, we were collecting some samples of that person. They're shown in green on these diagrams. Um, the 24 adapters are in this rainbow color. Um, I bring this up because sometimes you might realize that some samples cluster by adapters. These are little biases that can occur. Um, and you can spot them easily. And um, we also color code the batches. So batches the size of 24 that is subject for sequencing. And, um, and then the actual expression of each individual micron is shown in this blue to yellow gradient, where yellow is the highest expressed RNAs, and it's relative read frequency. So the, some of the reads that you will see add up to all reads annotated as micron. So the next slide here is the overview over all um, 300 samples. 
um, at the top is the summary of um, the calibrators. So you see that these calibrator sets um, are not really segregating very much. They all look very similar, so there's no major batch effect. And if they cluster together, then they cluster mostly by adapter where one or the other um, RNA in this set can differentiate slightly between uh, adapters and their ligation efficiencies um, are a little bit impacted. Um, below that the big square is um, all the microRNA clustering and you can see that on the left side all the pink samples show up and on the right side all the the green samples show up, so you get nice separation of plasma versus serum. And the person 12 samples as the dark green bar, um, they center right in the middle. You don't really, um, you, you still can separate the serum and the plasma of person 12, but um, the two samples are more similar to each other than they are from plasma and serum of the other volunteers. And uh, if you introduce a bit more stringent cutoffs and only use the libraries that were really very deep sequenced, you, um, you get that subset that we've shown here. And, and it's the same thing. Um, it's just a little bit easier to read for you. So then you turn to that DESEC um, differential expression analysis across samples. And the way you have to read this diagram on the y-axis, it's the difference of serum over plasma. So things that are enriched in serum are having a positive value, and things that are uh, depleted in serum have a negative value. And on the x-axis is the RNA abundance. So the further to the right, the more abundant um, that particular sequence in circulation. So the first thing you learn is that 451 and 486 are the most abundant RNAs in circulation, and those are erythrocyte-specific microRNAs. Uh, and 144 is part of 451, it's histronic. And, um, and in green, so in green and in the green and red arrows um, indicate for you um, the, the major changes of specific microRNAs. So if you generate serum after upon coagulation, you increase your platelet-specific RNA content, and you decrease the erythrocyte-specific content, presumably through absorption on the blood clot. Um, in this diagram, I have, we have sequenced red blood cells, platelets, and peripheral blood monocytes. And when you add them to clustering of plasma and serum samples, you see the erythrocytes with the plasma on the left side. Um, so the 451 and 144 in the top lines are enriched in erythrocytes relative to the right side, the platelet side. And, um, and if you look at the micron 223, which is also in the upper, upper third, you see it's enriched in the platelet side, but it's depleted in the erythrocyte side. And so that, that's how we draw the conclusions that, that I've just described. We then looked at sex-dependent differences. Um, I'm showing you here plasma samples on the left side. Or, you know, you can combine your plasma and serum samples, or you can only analyze serum samples. It doesn't really make a difference. Um, that's the point of showing these two. Um, but there is a approximately two-fold variation for epithelial microRNAs. They are increased in female. And there's neuroendocrine microRNA 375 that's increased in female. And there's also a little bit of muscle-specific microRNA in one that appears increased in female. Um, the other microns I can't get explained, like 146 or 224 or 218, 
they have broader cell type specificity, so they're not as easily assigned um, to a particular cell type. And I should say this implies that then if you perform analysis across uh, in your biomarker studies or so, that you may want to keep male and female separate at a, um, at a first uh, level of analysis, or you have to correct for it. Um, nutritional intake didn't really impact. Um, so the one hour versus no, no meal or the four hours after meal, uh, nothing happens. The statistics can play some funny games on you. As you see in the right panel, 584 or 383 p can appear statistically significant, but when you look at the opposite arm in microRNAs, the opposite strand of the microRNA stem loop, um, which in, uh, in the case of 584 is more abundant than the star sequence, there's no significant variation. So these are, when you get to low read frequencies, they become um, it's sparse in the way they, the, the reads come in and, and you get more mistakes. Um, there's similarly no difference except the um, small statistical variations in low abundant RNAs. Um, in, when you compare menstrual cycle um, in females. And, um, and so these are the, uh, the main findings. And I'd now like to turn to person 12 to discuss a little bit more in detail um, the outlier within our normal um, study. And so first I just want to show you evidence that person 12 plasma or serum samples are not batch effects. Uh, when we process our samples, they are they're properly randomized and um, across batches. And, and when you look at the clustering um, of the barcodes, sorry, clustering of the calibrators that were added across, you see that the samples of person 12, they are just randomly spread across the calibrator set. So they, they don't reveal a batch effect. Um, and you have to, to see this, you have to look in the batch line, which is the bottom line, and there's no real grouping. Um, that you detect. So if you then compute the differences of person 12 to, in this case, all other individuals, um, uh, and I, I admit we should have, which we will do also just cluster it against males because it's a male volunteer, um, but the, the main, the bigger differences that you will see here, they are not um, explained by um, the sex difference. And, and so you see there's a, a large number of differences. Um, um, the most striking ones I summarized in the next diagram. Um, so this is, this is showing you the serum before it was plasma. Um, so they are the same in, in plasma and serum. And here they are summarized um, by microRNA. So this most Different is microRNA 375, which is a neuroendocrine microRNA, and it's almost tenfold different um, in person 12 compared to the other individuals. And remember, the sex differences were about twofold differences in 375, so you're, you're far beyond that. Um, there's another microRNA 320, which um, I think is also neuroendocrine or neuronal, um, you see it often in neuronal tissues, the 320. 122 is a little bit elevated, um, which is the liver-specific microRNA. Um, but if you look at real liver injury cases, it goes up 50 or 100-fold in liver injury, and this is sort of a two-fold elevation, which would not be scorable by the classic um, liver injury markers, like ALT and AST, and we have tested the person. The person is ALT and AST negative, so there's no sign of liver injury. And then you see a bit of a variation for um, the, the overall plasma and, and serum composition, and you already noticed that there was also a lot more extracellular RNA in this person, so um, it's hard to interpret um, 
the, the, the 451 and 223 changes. And 182, um, I think, must be also part of this um, amateur poetic system, um, like 451. And it, it's, uh, it's also many much smaller sequence reads for 182 than for 451. But you see a similar trend. Um, so in the, I think in this particular person, the only way to explain this elevated total RNA content is that cells that secrete like hepatocytes that make serum proteins or the neuroendocrine cell types that provide hormones spill out extra RNA that then the person the person um, um, then, then, then gets in circulation. And so in summary here, um, I can say that um, we can recover extracellular and extracellular DNA without interference or, or reproducible um, from abundant RNAs and DNAs containing biofluids using automation and um, small volumes as starting points um, that we can monitor the quality by the spike ins. Um, that we see big differences like other people saw in RNA composition between plasma and serum and they're best explained by um, the red blood cell and platelet contributions and um, gains and losses through, through coagulation processes. Um, it's very important when you work with plasma to consider the removal of platelets or retention of platelets. They come down um, much later than the red blood cells and, and are then responsible for, for variations across studies um, or, or can introduce you know, a very big variable in, in your experiments if they're not consistently collected. Um, we see sex-dependent differences if you process your samples consistently. Um, and um, we have identified um, among the healthy individuals a, a biomarker for a yet to be determined condition um, where I believe it's sort of a secretory vesicle sorting conditions where you could imagine when you secrete proteins and you don't remove completely the cytoplasmic RNA contents or so that um, that this can then be the source of additional extracellular RNA. And so we are trying to pursue this particular person and the person's family, and we want to know if, and, and, and his parents or siblings, we also have these elevated extracellular RNA contents. And if there's a really underlying genetic cause, um, we would probably then engage in, in genome sequencing and see what could be the underlying reasons. And, um, we've also started now um, sequencing 300 individuals of, of plasma samples from 300 individuals to see how frequent it is that one can get um, this unusual uh, behavior of additional RNA than compared to most normal individuals. And so to acknowledge, um, I, I think I started it at the beginning, it was class. Um, that um, has done most of the experiments with help of assistants and colleagues of his group. And Zef is the, the key clinician um, in charge of collecting the samples and, and, and um, defining the details of the subject selection and depth of analysis. And I can now open this for questions and discussions. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Tom. Uh, just a reminder, if you, you ha might have your device muted, unmute that, uh, but uh, Tom's happy to take questions now. Uh, if you could uh, just identify yourself and the organization that you're with, uh, that'd be great. Hi, this is Louise Laurent, UCSD. Um, I have a question about um, the figure or the slide where you have the dendrogram with the red blood cell, platelets, um, et cetera. I think it's slide 15 or so. Um, I, it went by a little bit quickly. Um, so the okay. um, the micro RNAs you want you pointed out were, I think, 
was it 451 or which other ones were you looking at? So just to clarify, so there's blocks of two samples, which are two red blood cell samples, two platelet samples, and two PBMC samples. They're shown in red, brown, and blue. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they're separated a little bit from the core block, which are the micronic profiles of plasma samples and serum samples. Okay? Mm -hmm. And so, so the ones are the cells and platelets, and the others is the extracellular RNA isolated from the fluids in which those cells normally circulate. Mm -hmm. And you would expect in a certain way that the composition of plasma and serum mirrors the cell types which carry those cells. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you see there's big overlap. Um, among those, um, you see also a few exceptions. You see micron A 10B and um, what is it, micron A 122. You don't see in platelets or erythro in platelets or red blood cells, mm -hmm. but they are in circulation. So 122 is easily explained. It comes from the liver. In the process of making plasma proteins, you release some of the liver-specific microRNA. Yeah, so, but, but the majority of extracellular RNA is similar to red blood cell lineages and, and you know, platelets and are also from, from, from you know, the, the myeloid lineage. Right. So I wouldn't expect dramatically different profiles, but the 223 is a good differentiator um, in the hematopoietic lineage, and so is the micron 144 and 451. Uh, which is shown in red. Right. So I think my question was, um, you, you, I, I don't know, were you thinking that some of these explain the differences between plasma and serum? Yeah, exactly. So mm -hmm. which ones are you saying? So the main difference them? between plasma and serum is that in serum you increase microRNA 223 and other platelet-specific microRNA compared to plasma. And plasma... So I guess I'm trying to see, you know, so is 223 actually significantly, one, significantly different between, say, platelets and RBCs, and are, is it significantly different between the serum and plasma samples? Because it's pretty subtle. Yeah. No, 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 it's not subtle. I mean, the so if you look at 223 on the very left and on the very right, you know, in one case, it's it's very dark, the color, and the other case, it's bright yellow. So this is at least a tenfold difference in abundance in the cell types. And it's also among the most abundant microRNAs in the cell type, the 223 in platelets. Mm -hmm. And if you would go, I mean, I, I can jump and go back to the earlier slide, but everything that was color-coded in the differential expression analysis was statistically significant. And the difference we've seen were, I think, nearly tenfold differences. If you, if you allow me to just go back to the plasma differences. That's only one slide up. It wasn't so far away. You see here, this is a log 2 scale. So if you look at 2 to 3, it's log 2 is a fourfold difference. This is maybe a five or six fold difference um, in which two to three changes. These are not small changes. Okay, and then for your serum plasma difference, so here your, your x-axis is platelet versus erythrocyte specific, and then um, the serum and plasma difference is just related by... Wait, what you're looking at is the extracellular RNA composition or the difference in extracellular RNA composition between serum and plasma. Yeah, so there's a four-fold oh. or more difference in erythrocyte and platelet-specific microRNAs. In the I see. So the data doesn't reflect the platelet versus erythrocyte um, expression. This is just your serum versus plasma. Is that yes. it? Serum versus okay. plasma. And the difference is on the tissue or cell type level, if you use cellular RNA, 
sort of reflect that, that 223 is probably tenfold increase in abundance over erythrocytes. And the 451, which is the very top line, um, there's maybe even 50 times more microRNA 451 in red blood cells over um, the platelets. Okay. Yeah. It just, I think maybe the color scale is not reflecting actually the differences. Um, well, the color you know, scale. It's basically, if you look at the top, um, the top line 451 in serum and plasma, I think basically it's, um, at least on my screen, it looks like it's saturated. Uh, I see what you're saying. I think the serum, the serum is a little bit less in 451. And um, and that's what you should see here as well. You know, it's it's a less than fourfold difference. And um, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is the problem with color scales. Um, yeah. That's why you need to go through the um, the statistical analysis. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So there have been, you know, there have been various arguments and models that to explain the difference between plasma and serum. Um, also, in terms of the tRNA content, um, that that changed dramatically between those things. So in some instances, people say when you add magnesium um, to prevent coagulation, um, which is if you chelate magnesium away. Um, it can destabilize many RNA protein complexes, and, and so you decrease stability and, and you get less RNA, um, or certain RNAs disappear. Um, but then we also have this argument about blood clots and what that it can absorb and capture things. So um, I think there has been a whole range of explanations that people have offered for various observations. Um, but uh, I don't think anybody has combined measuring the absolute amounts of RNAs and then interpreting that change together with the microRNA abundance changes. Hey, Tom, this is Trish Lebowski at the NIH. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Hi. Um, I, I had to step out um, in the middle, so excuse me if I missed this, but uh, it seems like you guys are pretty close to what you might call an xRNA ohm, at least from the serum and platelets from individuals. You know, I heard you talk about sex differences and all. Um, and then you had the one individual that had all these differences. What I missed was, was this a completely healthy volunteer or was there anything? Yeah, he's completely healthy. We checked him out completely. We stuck him through the MRI and we did all the blood biomarker measurements. Mm -hmm. Nothing, nothing yet that points to any major health issues at this point. Okay, so would that argue against the idea that there might be um, a handful, or maybe more than a handful, of xRNAs in serum or, or blood that would define health? Um, I mean, as I said before, the it, you know, tissue injury markers um, like cardiac troponin for heart disease or ALT and AST for liver diseases, um, you can capture them easily by microRNAs. Mm. Um, but, but it's cheaper to just use the clinical tests, and they are also faster than the um, ELISA test based. Um, but there's not so many tissue injury markers. Um, where you can find circulating proteins. And it's, I think, a little similar for microRNAs that, um, that, that there's sort of a limited opportunity, um, I think, to damage tissues. Um, you, what is maybe the best way to explain it? I, I bring up again this slide here, um, where you see plasma and serum compared to the cell types. And you see a few black spots in there. Right. Where there's no microRNA in the cells, 
but it is in circulation. Right. So these are the interesting um, things you can sort of pick up. Elevation of micron A 122 because um, it's not in the platelets or in the aristocytes that are the major components. Um, and there's a small baseline contribution of 122 in healthy individuals. And then you can go above this dramatically, 100-fold up, and it's easily captured. Um, and if you plotted all the microns that are very specific in their tissue types, you could find, I don't know, epithelial microRNAs in circulation that are very low if it's a background. So, but it's not clear to me what disease conditions would um, you would be able to discover that are not already causing some pain and the person would go to the doctor and get some diagnostic tests done. Okay, so well, thank you. So this one person that is totally healthy that has an altered composition, which makes it very intriguing that you can, it's, I don't know, it's a bit like high cholesterol. Mm -hmm. You know, a portion of those people will come down with um, arterial cholesterol. And you know that that's true, but not every person that has elevated level will die of or develop it. And, and so it's more a question, I think, how frequent you will find aberration. That's why the next level study is coming and looking at 300 people and using the same standardized protocols for RNA analysis. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Tom, hello. Yeah. Hi, uh, this is Anna Kruczewski from Brigham and Women's Hospital. So. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm asking about the, I have a question about the same slide. So 10D, as you mentioned, seems to be quite unusual. Um, so do you have any idea where it could come from? I guess the question is, it might be really important because, you know, ten, near 10D is certainly one of the most interesting cancer biomarkers. So um, it would be important yeah. to understand what contributes to its high level in uh, plasma and serum. Yeah, I don't, um, I would have, so we have a lot of tissue microRNA expression profiles collected. Mm -hmm. And so we have to go through those and then figure out if um, 122 is just tracking 10B, um, which I don't think it is um, because it's, it's equal in abundance, and 122 is the by far most abundant microRNA in the liver, followed by 21. So, so 10B and 122 are not the same origin. I can be pretty certain about that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it must be. Um, yeah, I have to look at this if it is um, endothelial contribution or um, if it's from a. Um, it's also not a subpopulation of the PBMCs because there's no 10B there. Mm -hmm. And 10B is a Hox gene cluster expressed microRNA, so it's something quite unusual. I think it's, it mostly tracks this Hox, Hox gene expression, which is more a developmental right. uh, process. Right. Uh, but it could come indeed from endothelial cells if it is highly expressed in uh, various endothelial, types of endothelial cells. So it's, I, I don't know if it's the major origin or not, but it certainly um, could be. I can't really, I can't comment. I know this is this is something where we have to maybe, I guess, address in the discussion as we are writing this at the moment. Yep. Um, it's a good point. Are there any more questions? Last call for any questions for Tom? Okay, if not, well, Tom, thank you very much, and thanks to all of you for joining.